Well, I am in Cambridge, Vermont today. This area have been Cambridge Junction, Vermont. And what do I find? The Reformer train station. This is Patricia, and I am traveling for history. I see some uh, boards, history boards over here, uh, storyboards, and uh, I'm going to uh, go over there and film. So hang on just a moment. You may be interested to know that this is the rail trail right here. That's a covered bridge. It's not a railroad bridge, but uh, you can watch another video I have on that. Poland covered bridge. Alrighty. That crunching sound is the snow I am walking on. Clearly this was a ticket booth in its day. Alright, and look at these wonderful pieces here. Some more over here. All right. This is the early view of the junction. This uh, picture right here. Sorry about the uh, glare. love historic photos. Don't know about you. <laughs> hmm. Nothing I can do about the glare. The sun is uh, setting. All right, so another picture right here. Oh. And this over here so you have something interesting to look at as opposed to what I'm about to read to you. The area where you're standing now looked very different a few hundred years ago. This part of the rail trail was once a bustling train stop with a nearby train station and many more buildings and services that supported the railway. See how different the landscape looked in 1910 in the large photo on the other panel. Oh yeah, you'll see that soon. 1700s to 1800s, a town begins and grows. The town of Cambridge had been granted by Thomas Chittenden in 1780, that's 80, and chartered, charted in August 13, 1781. The area was first settled by John Spafford in 1783. At the time, his nearest neighbor was 20 miles away in Jericho, and the nearest road was Hazen Road in Craftsbury. On March 29, 1785, the town was officially organized. The many rivers and streams in the town offered ideal locations for mills. The first sawmill was built in 1785. Soon after the first grist mills were built in 1791, the same year that Vermont became the 14th state and the University of Vermont was chartered. The town began to develop, bringing millers, blacksmiths, shoemakers, tailors, wheelwrights, harness makers, and more skilled trades. The area was well noted for its ideal landscape for farming and maple sugaring. Farmers in the area became well known for the butter they produced. In 1827, the first post office was built in the center village. They decided to call it Jeffersonville after President Jefferson. Soon other areas in town also had their own post offices, including North Cambridge, East Cambridge, and Pleasant Valley, to name a few. We still refer to these areas by those names. The Cambridge Junction Post Office was established in the train station in 1892. Transportation routes continued to develop with the first arched bridge built by Enoch Carleton and Joseph P. Hawley in 1832. Later, in 1867, the construction of a road going through Smuggler's Notch began. It was not completed until 1883. By 1840, the town population grew to 1,790. 
the late 1800s, the bustling railroad town. In 1864, a charter was obtained to construct a railroad from St. Johnsbury to New Hampshire. Boosted into life in 1867 with investment from the Fairbanks family, the route began to take shape. It wasn't until July 1877 that Governor Fairbanks drove the last spike into the completed 96-mile mile rail line. In 1874, the town of Cambridge got on board and agreed to aid in the construction of the rail line from the, quote, shore waters of the Lake Champlain and the city of Burlington to some point in the town of Cambridge to connect with the Lamoille Valley Railroad, unquote. Both the St. Johnsbury and Lake Champlain Railroad and the Burlington and Lamoille Railroad passed through the town. On September 4, 1886, work began on the Union Station at Cambridge Junction by the Burlington and Lamoille and the Vermont Division of the Boston and Lowell Railroads, b &L. The original train station contained a waiting room, ticket room, and post office on the first floor. William Thomas and his family lived on the second floor. This is the original train station right here. Yeah. There we go. And this is train station number two in this photograph. The story of the Poland covered bridge, which is that right there. In the in the eighteen eighties, Cambridge Junction was a significant Railroad Junction, where the Vermont Division of the Portland and Ogdensburg met the Burlington and Lamoille Railroad. Those living in Waterville and Belvedere wanted a shorter route to the trains. A bridge would accomplish this, but Cambridge viewed such a bridge unnecessary for two reasons. It would have no particular use for its residents, and it would add to the taxes. Luke P. Poland of Waterville, a lawyer who had been Chief Justice of the Vermont Supreme Court, a representative and senator in Washington, D.C., made such a bridge a project in his retirement years. He led a lawsuit judgment ordering a bridge and a connecting road be built by the town of Cambridge. Cambridge dragged its feet, but on June 8, 1887, the town voted to instruct the selectmen, Charles Holmes, Jason French, and Roscoe Fuller, to construct the bridge at a cost of six to $10,000. George W. Holmes began the construction in September 1887, and it was named the Poland Bridge. Not everyone was pleased with the new bridge, as noted in a newspaper article on June 15, 1887. Quote, Judge Poland has caused the town of Cambridge to be inflicted with a bridge and a road at an expense of six to $10,000, which, as shown, will be of no material benefit to anyone but himself. It will be known as the Poland Bridge, except to the taxpayers of Cambridge who will christen it the Bridge of Sighs. Poland did not live to use the bridge, dying in his hayfield the following July. Now this is a photo of when it was being built. It was taken by Ella Holmes Waterman. And this, of course, decades later. You can watch my video on that if you are so inclined. All right, so this is the bird's eye view of the junction. This is from a 1910 postcard. And apparently these buildings still exist today. Oh, no, excuse me. Um, the ones with the asterisks still exist today. All righty. What else can you look at that's nicer than this? Oh, keep looking at the Poland Cover Bridge. The 1900s, railway heyday. The town continued to grow. By 1905, there were over a dozen dwellings near where you stand. Many still exist, including the old schoolhouse, which has been converted into a home. Roscoe Fuller ran the store, a livery, and a farm. Willie Brothers, who were cattle dealers, had holding pens this side of the creamery, which was called the New England Dairy. There was a large ice house at the end of the creamery building and a hotel that housed traveling salesmen and railroad road employees. The Cambridge Junction Post Office was located in the former Ralph Bourne store 
before it was discontinued on July 31, 1958. The struggling rail line, and there's a lot of that. There was a lot of that, certainly in Vermont, probably elsewhere too. The rail line struggled throughout much of its history. It changed hands from the St. John's Ray and Lake Champlain line, St. J and LC, to the Boston and Lowell line, B and L, and back again through the 1800s. It continued to struggle through the 1920s and the devastating flood of 1927. 1930s showed continued decline in passenger rail use due to the increased use of automobiles. By 1944, the rail line was $3 million in debt. After coming out of bankruptcy in 1948, the newly re restructured St. J and LC began to modernize with new diesel engines. In 1967, Sam Pinsley, who owned several other rail lines in Vermont, purchased the railroad. In order to further modernize the rail line, most of the iconic covered bridges were removed to make way for larger diesel engines. The only remaining covered railroad bridge was the Fisher Bridge in Wolcott. That's in this county. There is another one in Asin County, only two left in the state. The East Shoreham Covered Railroad Bridge, which is in Asin County, and the Fisher Covered Bridge was in Wolcott. I'll, I'll put a link uh, to those two videos because I filmed them both. In 1973, the railway was purchased by the state of Vermont and operated by several companies. In 1978, it became the Lamoille Valley Railroad and continued with limited use through the 1980s until operations ceased in 1994. In 1997, today's modern rail trail. In 1997, plans began to develop the recreation rail trail we're enjoying now. Today, the train engines, rail cars, and tracks are long gone but the idea of providing a true connection to Vermonters and Vermont communities along the way is becoming real again. The Lamoille Valley Rail Trail, a project spearheaded by VAST, the Vermont Association of Snow Travelers, in partnership with VTRANS, the Vermont Agency of Transportation, is transforming this entire route, this time for people instead of trains. With the help of Vermonters and others who love the Green Mountain State, we are creating a multi-purpose four-season recreational trail through some of Vermont's most beautiful and iconic landscapes. All right, so let's talk about a series of tragedies. Fire on January 26, 1922. A blaze was discovered around 9.30 a.m., apparently from an overheated furnace. A bucket brigade from the nearby Lamoille River was hampered by a negative 32 degrees Fahrenheit temperature that day, which is fairly equivalent to 30, minus 32 Celsius. The only rooms saved, along with some important papers, were the waiting room, ticket office, post office, and freight house. The flood of 1927. The train began in the late evening on Wednesday, November 2, and continued all night. Early the next morning, the rain was heavy and continued all day until dark. Relief did not come until noon on November 4, by that time, six to eight inches of rain had fallen in just a three-day period. So this is a photograph of the fire of 1922. This is the flood of 1927. There are uh, more photographs, too. This is the Roscoe Fuller. Fuller and Claire Fuller and son Hal with his dog, Sport. The hotel can be seen on the right and uh, was managed by Viola Stockwell until it burned in 1921. Loading the Christmas trees at Cambridge Junction, postcard from 1906. The building on the right still exists today. It was Borden's General Store and served as the post office from about 1915 to 1958. And this is the old creamery, which is still standing. Then this is the ice harvest. The ice harvest was stored at Cambridge Junction to be used in the creamery. Very cool. Very cool. And you saw this already. But let's do a walk around as much as I can because it's pretty icy here. With the sun setting, it's uh, getting colder too. 
as you would imagine. Um, let me see. I'm going to pause this and then show you when I get to my destination. Okay, so this is a side of it, the side that faces the road. There is a porta potty here, by the way, for those who are perhaps walking the rail trail or like, like me, just happen to be here. I love these, these here, right here. It has certainly a flair for the Italianate style. Um, the New Haven Junction train station has, has since been moved from its original spot. I'll, I'll link to that video as well. Um, and it also had the Italianate features, as I recall. Over here we have this uh, playground. This is uh, <laughs> some slides coming off of that that uh, wooden train there. I'm guessing it's wooden. Looks like it's wooden. Um, then over here we have uh, what looks like a caboose to me. And uh, let's go take a closer look at that, shall we? Alrighty, well. Uh, carry in, carry out means you can eat here. Whatever your trash you have, take it with you. Recycling, take it with you. They don't want you to, they don't want it left here. There are three places to sit and eat. I think this is fabulous. And what do you folks think? They all appear to be the same. And then this is the Lemoyle Rail Trail. It's so much easier to take these from an angle than it is right in front of them. I can't back up far enough in order to uh, photograph it. But uh, you can see we're in Cambridge, so there's the Cambridge one. There's one for uh, Johnson, Hyde Park, Morrisville. It, looks, it is the same trail that goes through all those towns. And then over here... The crunching sound you're hearing is the uh, the snow with ice, and uh, it's been melting. It's been fairly warm here, so um, take the force with. My cane's been sliding too. It's starting to get cold again. So, all right, you can see some more of this this um, Italianate structure, which I love. And uh, we're back to where we started. Trunk's right there. Alrighty, well, this is Patricia and I'm traveling for history. I'm on all the social media you are. Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Traveling for History 1, Ellen Traveling. I'm also on Twitter, Traveling for High 1. And uh, all my videos go live at 12.30 a.m. EDT, Eastern Daylight Time. Those videos that say premiere on them, there's a live chat. And you can come and chat with yours truly. That would be me. And uh, I chat for as long as the video is live. This one is a long one, so more opportunities to chat. All right, so until I see you again, I hope you have an absolutely fabulous night. This is Patricia, and I'm traveling for history.